In the money line tonight, the Dow Jones Industrials down more than 2% on concerns in part about the nuclear crisis in Japan. The Nasdaq, the S&P, both down almost 2%. The Dow plunged right after a European Union commissioner came out and said the situation in Japan is, quote, essentially out of control. Moments later, a spokesman for the EU acknowledged the commissioner had no specific information, and the Dow Jones Industrials then recovered, at least temporarily. It did sell off, but not to those levels. The losses are mounting around the world. On Wall Street, the Dow is down 3.5% so far this week. And that brings us to tonight's Market Masters. Joining me now are Peter Schiff. He's the CEO and Chief Global Strategist at Euro-Pacific Capital. And David Walker, former controller of the United States, President and CEO of the Come Back America Initiative. David, good to have you with us. Peter, thank you. Thank Let's you. start, uh, if I may, with you, Peter. Uh, the market today selling off uh, as it has throughout the, uh, the week. What should we expect uh, in the equities markets? Well, you know, we had a very big rally, and so now there's been a reason to sell. People had mm -hmm. some pretty big profits. But I think the real concern for people who understand what's going on is that the earthquake in Japan can set off a financial earthquake here. Because, you know, we owe Japan, the U.S. government owes Japan close to a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you think of their treasuries as a rainy day fund, I mean, it's pouring over there. So they might have to start cashing in some of these treasuries, which means we're going to have to pay up. And so either the Fed's going to have to print a lot of money to buy those treasuries, which means more inflation, or they're not going to step up, which means much higher interest rates, and we're right back in recession. You're not satisfied by the Japanese assurances and the Bank of Japan's assurances that there will be, uh, uh, they're not going to resort to selling U.S. securities? Well, what else are they going to do? Just go, are they going to go out and borrow new money rather than just cashing in their, their low interest rate at U.S. Treasuries? Well, they've got, and, a, they've got a printing press, too. But though. why use it? If they, they, well, see, what Japan needs right now is a stronger yen because they need to buy a lot of natural resources. They don't need to create inflation and drive prices higher. David Walker, are you concerned as well? Well, I am concerned. I mean, frankly, the largest holder of our debt right now is the Federal Reserve. And they're going to end up owning more than Japan and China combined within a year on our current path. The other thing I'm concerned about is that uh, the Comeback America Initiative, along with Stanford, is going to issue a ranking of 34 countries in the world next Wednesday, uh, where the United States is going to be a lot closer to the bottom three than the top three for fiscal responsibility and sustainability. You know, we've got serious problems and Washington's talking about short-term spending and not dealing with the true threat that, that, uh, that, l that lies ahead. Well, here, here's the threat that we all, that's clear and present, if you will. Uh, Japan, the third largest economy in the world, is absolutely racked now with uh, un un unspeakable disasters uh, and unthinkable uh, a, a crisis with its nuclear power plants uh, and its economy. Uh, what do you expect to be the impact on Peter, the Japanese economy and the global economy, most specifically the U.S. Well, clearly the impact here is very negative for Japan because their, their production is being disrupted, their output. I don't know what's going to happen with, with, with radiation, but I do know that Japan is a major global creditor. Japan has been lending money all around the world, and now Japan is in a position where it needs some of that money back. So if you have one of the biggest creditors all of a sudden needing more money, uh, that is a game changer. And you already have problems in China. I mean, China is suffering a lot of inflation as a result of all the dollars and treasuries they've had to buy because they have to print up their own currency to do that. So I think it's, it could create a lot of problems for the United States because who is going to lend to us? Who is going to finance? We have a $1.6 trillion deficit in fiscal 2011. And what about next year? And you know, we have very short well, maturities looking, looking on our the, debt. I'm looking at the treasury market and I see that for two days in a row it's, it's become, up. It's, it's up been, now because maybe the Fed well, is in their mind. I the sentence, actually, Peter. Uh, for two days in a row, it's become the safe haven of choice, not gold, but U.S. securities. Surely well, that gives you some... I don't think they're the safe haven when the dollar today is at an all-time record low against the Swiss franc, when the dollar is at a 16-year low, almost a record low against the Japanese yen. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look like a safe haven to me. In fact, the U.S. dollar index, which is a basket of currencies, is very close to the lows. I mean, the dollar is not rallying despite everything that's going on, which should tell you that it no longer has that safe haven status. Do you, do you agree with Peter, David? Lou, we are a temporary safe haven. But if you look at what's going on with regard to our spending policy, our deficits and debt, if you look right. at what's going on with regard to our monetary policy, we are going to have real problems with regard to interest rates and inflation and the value of the dollar over time if we don't start developing a plan that will deal with the 88% of the budget that, that Washington is not even talking about 
and engages in comprehensive tax reform that will make us more competitive and generate more revenues. Yeah. The 88% the solution, referring to entitlements, uh, you know, I, and by the way, I'm, I'm on your side. I'd love to see fiscal responsibility return to Washington, yeah. responsible uh, government. I think, I think it's too late for a plan, though. We need action. We just can't talk about things that we're going to do in the future. We need to do concrete things right now. We need, a, we need trillions of dollars of cuts right now. Right. We can't just say, well, we're going to do something in the future and have a plan. We don't have a long time. I mean, it's a very short fuse on this bomb. You know, uh, Lou, I think, I yeah, think the ahead. real key is going to be the debt ceiling limit. I apologize. What we need to do is do something concrete in conjunction with the debt ceiling limit that will force tough choices on this, uh, the 88 percent they're not talking about, that will get us to comprehensive tax reform sooner rather than later. That's what we need to be doing. Now, you know, listening to you, watching you gentlemen, are people who are saying, my God, they're talking about reducing the size of the federal government, reducing spending. That will be depressing uh, to the economy rather than stimulative because they have been inundated with all sorts of, uh, uh, of messages saying that the only way that you're going to have a job, the only way yeah. you're going to be able to make a living in this country is if we stimulate the economy as if we haven't been stimulated. Well, government spending doesn't stimulate the economy. It's a drag on the economy. The productive sector of the economy has to support all this government. Look, at, at, in, in 1900, I think all governments, state, federal, and local, only spent 5% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before the Second World War, I think it was up to 20, 25%. But we had strong economies. We had an industrial revolution. We had massive economic growth when we had a small government. Right. The key to having a strong economy is shrinking government and liberating those resources, freeing up the private sector to really grow the economy. Lou, the truth is I just flew in from London this morning to be with you today and the well, fact you. of the matter is is that they're trying to cut too much too fast. They're trying to cut 20 mm -hmm. to 25 percent in one year. We clearly need to be cutting more than Washington's talking about now but a little, over a little bit longer period of time. But the real threat are the entitlement programs, the mandatory spending and an outdated tax policy. And the day of reckoning is coming and we've got to do something concrete in conjunction with the debt ceiling limit. I sure hope they do. Yeah. We well, shouldn't worry about cutting spending too fast. We can't cut it fast enough. And, and the idea that uh, we're going to cut it at all, we've got to, <laughs> in the current uh, budget, as you gentlemen know, uh, the Democrats are talking about one day's borrowing. That's what they want to take out of a, a $3.7 trillion dollar budget. The Republicans are talking about one week's uh, yeah, they're, borrowing. They're, they're arguing uh, this, is a, this is playing at the margin. Yeah, they're arguing over a rounding error. We have a, a budget of about $3.7 trillion, a deficit of $1.6 trillion, and they're talking about $20, $30, $40 billion. That's nothing. Yeah. Lou, they're arguing about the bar tab on the Titanic. Well, that's <laughs> when we're headed for an iceberg that could sink the ship of state. Well, you know, and if, if you've got a if you've got a way, and I know you've been thinking about this a lot, if you've got a way to get it done, this is the time to say this is the way. David, what's the way? Good to be with. Well, the way is in the book Come Back America. Go to the website tcai. <laughs> I set you up, org. David. Hey, there I you go. Book. You did a great job, Lou. <laughs> okay, David. Thank you, gentlemen. Peter, Take thank care. you very Thank much. you, Lou.